Um, aloha mai kako. Mahalo for joining us this evening. Fully, the organization coordinating this stream was birthed from a shared drive to work our system by seeking AINA-based equity-focused leadership for our Hawaii Island community. Now more than ever, we need leaders who are willing to step up and circle back to our roots and instill real change in our community from Kona to Ka'u, from Hilo to Havi. The time is now to holy the system. Conducting our interviews tonight are Shanti and Monica. And I'd also like to welcome Representative Nicole Lowen of District 6. Uh, Nicole, why don't you take a second to, or a couple minutes to introduce yourself? Sure, hi, um, I'm Nicole Lowen. I represent House District 6, uh, which goes from um, uh, Royal Poinciana, so a little bit south of Kailua Kona Town, all the way up to um, a little bit past Kona Airport, and also includes um, Halualoa, up Malka, some of those areas. And then um, I've been representing that area since 2012. So this is my fifth term that I'm in and my 10th year in office, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I've been in Hawaii. I wasn't born and raised in Hawaii, but I've been um, living uh, you know, in Kona almost the entire time for 25 years. So I first moved there in 1996. Um, I was a teacher, uh, you know, before I moved to Hawaii, and then also for many years in Kona, I worked at Hawaii Montessori School. So I kind of come from that background, and then I also um, eventually went back to school and did my master's in urban planning, and then, you know, ended up running for office, which had never really been a part of the plan. Um, uh, and let's see, um, I guess, you know, I guess what drove me to, to run, you know, a lot of a lot of that came from having a passion about environmental issues that has been, um, you know, where I've focused a lot of my work while well, at the time I've been at the legislature. But, you know, also once you're in office, you sort of, your job is to look at the universe of issues that face your community. And so, you know, the process of running for office and then holding office, it's clear that we have really pressing issues like just cost of living issues, affordable housing, education, those are really top of mind for people. Um, and then the environmental issues, you know, I think are and natural resource protection in particular are important to people as well. Um, I currently chair the Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection in the State House. So I do spend a lot of my time working on those issues because it's, you know, a lot more demanding to chair a committee and you're, you're expected to focus a lot of your energy on working on those specifically. But um, also really strongly support the work of my colleagues in other areas where they're leading. Uh, doing really important work. Um, I also sit on the committee currently on judiciary and um, agriculture, also another big issue for Hawaii Island. Um, and yeah, there's a lot to cover. So I think I'll turn it over to your questions and see what you guys have to say. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that background. And I think Shanti is going to kick us off with the first question. Sure. Um, how have you advocated for your community and what community projects have you worked on? Um, it's hard to do a laundry list like 10 years in, but I feel like um, there's so many different ways that we work for our community. I mean, you, you learn a lot about what the needs are through the process of campaigning and holding office and talking to a lot of different people. Um, you know, you can advocate at the legislature. Um, by helping to fund projects, have like improvements at our schools or needed infrastructure projects or working on legislation that impacts the community. Um, but you also, there's also a lot of really specific work for individual members, you know, maybe who are just having a, um, you know, problem they need help with or people just need help navigating the system um, and finding services that may already be available, but just connecting people with that. Um, you know, during the pandemic, I think we worked harder than ever, really. It was so busy, especially uh, like we, I felt like became a, a satellite office of the unemployment office and we're just like fielding calls and sending out information and, you know, trying to reassure people was like a lot of it. So there's, there's just a lot of different ways. So whether it's doing something like helping fund, you know, Palamanui campus and courthouse, which are like two big infrastructure projects I helped fund. Um, or just the day-to-day, -day, like, let me help you get an appointment at the DMV kind of stuff. Like, I think we do, um, we do all of the above. 
Wonderful. Thank awesome. You. Uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time out to talk to us, Representative Lowen. Um, my question, um, as our senator, your role is to write legislation. Representative, you gave me a promotion, but. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. After, as our representative, your role is to write legislation um, that meets the needs of the people you represent, uh, like you were just talking about. Um, what are the critical issues that have arisen in your district that can be addressed by the state legislator, le legislature, and how did you address these problems in the past uh, legislative session? And then how do you plan to address them in the coming years uh, if you're reelected? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say what are the issues facing the district? I mean, I think right now the top issues facing the district are um, affordable housing and cost of living issues. I think those are the top ones. And then, um, you know, also just sort of having a, a growing, we've had longstanding issues with lack of, um, you know, not having enough teachers, not having enough healthcare workers, not having enough doctors in certain specialty areas and stuff. And I think that has gotten, even gotten worse this year. I don't know if it's pandemic related or what exactly accounts for it. So those I think are, um, you know, the biggest issues facing facing our district right now. And there's a lot of bills. It's kind of hard to do a laundry list of all of them. I'm not, like I said, as a chair of the Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection, a lot of my personal, my primary introduced bills are in that area, but I co-sponsored, you know, a, a ton of bills um, related to housing. Those were actually our majority caucus package bills were some of the housing bills, funding DHHL, adequately so that they can get people, beneficiaries off the wait list and build homes for them. Um, and just providing record amount of funding to our other um, capital funds to help finance affordable housing. Um, it, it's, it sounds, it doesn't sound very exciting. And I think, I feel like we also say this every year, oh, we put a bunch of money aside for this, but there really are like never before, like 10 times more than ever before, like amounts of funding. And there have been increases in recent years too. So I think it takes some time for that to translate into more homes built, but there have been more homes built and there will be more homes built. And that's gonna be part of um, helping to address the problem. Um, and then there's a number of other bills like, uh, you know, there's the um, minimum wage and a bunch of uh, tax reform bills, EIT, making the EITC refundable and permanent. Um, and then, um, you know, small other programs like homeowners assistance for uh, first time home buyers, the Kapuna rental assistance and uh, a number of other um, bills like that. Uh, other ways, I mean, I think in the, I had a bill this year that kind of was in the news a bit to try to um, fund a needs and site assessment for a, a new, to figure out where we would site a new Kona hospital because I think uh, a, a new hospital facility is needed because our old one is so outdated you know, that would probably still remain. It wouldn't be like we're replacing it. There would still be a facility where the current hospital is now. But um, but the new hospital, I think, would also potentially help with attracting more healthcare workers to Hawaii because it would, could be a much nicer, more attractive facility, a more convenient place to work, closer to where homes are located. Um, and the, the push of new development is kind of further north. So uh, that's a few of the things I've done, I guess. And I could talk at length, I guess, about all my energy and environment bills, but, and I think, I mean, climate change is to me really the overarching issue of our time. It's, it's super important, but at the same time, I know that when I go out and talk to people in the district day to day and hear from people, they're struggling to pay the rent and find places to live. And I think that is an immediate need that, you know, maybe is of more interest to people than some of the climate change bills, but maybe you have further questions about that, so. Yeah, we do. We touch on a, a little bit of the environmental stuff later too. Thanks. Thanks for answering that. Um, in what ways do you create equitable spaces for your community's input as a legislator? How do you accommodate those with low access to technological resources and other communication barriers? Um, you know, I try to do a lot of um, communications just with direct mail. So, you know, we use a lot of our legislative allowance budget to, you know, keep mail our mailing list and keep the district informed. Um, you know, we also do email blasts with information, but that might not, I guess you could, there could be equity issues potentially if people don't have computers. Um, 
I mean, I think I just try to be accessible and have an open door policy. I'm always willing to talk to, to anyone. Um, you know, we, it's been harder during the pandemic. We haven't been able to have in-person events for quite some time. And I think we can now, but I haven't done it yet just because we're so busy, busy in session. Um, there hasn't been a chance to do it yet. Hopefully after session ends and, um, you know, not having to be in Honolulu on the weekdays, then it'll be easier to do an in-person event that's more accessible. But um, I don't know. I think it's just being always being willing to to hear from anyone or talk to anyone or try to try to figure out how you can help people with their issues. I mean, sometimes you get emails that maybe aren't very well written, you know, but it's like we would never be dismissive of anything like that. Like, um, yeah, if people are asking for help with a problem, sometimes we might not be the right place to come to, but we always try to figure out how to point them to where they should and can go look for assistance. Alrighty, um, along those same lines, um, how do you engage and support your constituents to work together uh, on finding equitable solutions to community issues? Um, I mean, it depends on the issue, I guess. Like I said, it, it's, it was, you know, whether it's just having talk stories and inviting people in or consulting with people in the community, like on, you know, certain issues that I know certain members of the community are interested in or is relevant to them. It could be something like, um, uh, you know, you can, we can pull together working groups or task forces to bring community members together. Um, we did that with, uh, trying to get rules made for the manta ray dive sites that are so overcrowded. We passed a resolution for that in 2014, maybe. Um, we did that for, you know, the, there was um, these like very weirdly configured dangerous bike lanes on Queen K that they restriped and like moved over to the right. And that was like result of bringing um, community members together, you know, some of our local like path and cycling groups and things like that to meet with the DOT and be able to tell them what the issues were. Um, so there's, there's things like that in, in that kind of way. And then I think it's always being willing to engage also like there's, there can be grassroots groups um, that are interested in issues or doing work on their own. And then if, I, if they I want me to, you know, be a part of it, I'm always like happy to be available. Thank you. Um, so I'll go back into affordable housing. You talked a little bit about that. Uh, what paradigm shifting solutions can you offer so that rising real estate prices and values do not correspondingly increase the cost of housing and cost of living pushing out locals from the housing market? Yeah, I mean, it's challenging because, well, there's there's like, what are the bigger, the overarching issues, right? That we can't just build ourselves out of. It's like, one is that so many of our sales go to out of state owners. And unfortunately, I think there's challenges in addressing that just with the US constitution and the interstate commerce clause. Um, I, we could potentially do, um, well, I actually don't think that we could necessarily do something about international buyers. So I think this, and then there's like an issue of how many homes are being used as vacation rentals. So those are like two things we could regulate more strictly. Um, and I'm in support of that. I think there is a lot of pushback, right? There's a lot of members of the community who disagree with that stance. Um, and they're also constituents and they also get to have a voice. So. So that's, you know, things that need to be discussed and worked on and maybe even just to pull together some of the, the data showing like how many of our sales are out of state owners and, um, and why we need to do something about it. But in terms of what we can do, that's really a paradigm shift. I mean, it's like you have to make it less of, it's hard because Hawaii is always gonna be an attractive place to wanna buy property and real estate's always gonna have high value and you can't or nor would you wanna do anything to decrease that, but you could look at the tax structure and how much you tax um, second homes or um, uh, Airbnb kind of uh, vacation rental properties. Um, because I think Hawaii has extremely low tax rates, property tax rates compared to most other states. And so it's an attractive um, place for a wealthy person, for example, to buy an investment property. Um, and so you could make that like a less attractive option by having a different tax structure. Of course, a lot of people will have very strong objections 
to this idea. And then at the same time, when stuff like, well, also that's a county solution, right? We can't do that by the state legislature. Um, and, and second, sometimes there are, there are people that get affected by these policies that aren't the ones you intended to catch. So there are, we always, you know, you try to propose things like this and then you end up hearing from people who say, well, we have a second home that we like scrimped and saved to buy and rented out long-term and that's like our income and, you know, like why are we being punished and things like that. So I think that's part of the job of being a legislator is there's just, um, there's always a lot of different voices and you have to listen to them all and try to find, try to find the right balance. If those two bills are um, dealt with, particularly on the county level, are there other solutions that um, the state is considering or bills that you've seen this session that you think are promising? Well, like I, all the ones I mentioned earlier, right? I think we're really working to tackle the affordable housing issue. I think, um, build, like, I think building more homes is a part of the solution. I think that um, par paradigm shifts also as a planner, and then now I'm getting back to stuff that could be done at, at the county level. <laughs> But I mean, we need to be open to higher density and different kinds of patterns of development um, because a lot of the cost of housing is in the land cost. And if you can build more, you know, higher, if you can build more apartments, if you can, you know, build smaller lots, that will help provide more affordable properties at lower cost. And I don't know, I think it's actually something that I think I wish, I think people in Kona most of the development there is like single family home on a quarter acre lot kind of thing. So people are very used to the idea of that. And, you know, having a driveway they can like hang out in and, and I have their outdoor living room kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's nice to have apartment options also. It's a lot less cost. It's a lot less like time spent working on your yard and things like that. So I think it's, it does require a shift in like what people think they want kind of opening people up to new possibilities. But I do think that what we have in Kona largely right now is a lot of sprawl. Um, and if we could find a way to reduce that sprawl, we would be able to provide more affordable homes. But uh, there would be people that didn't like that also, that didn't like the idea of building higher or building higher density. And you mentioned um, working on a bill with DHHL to increase funding. Um, to them for new builds. Can you elaborate on the status of, of that bill and what it sure, entails? Uh, that's going, I forget the bill number, but that's going to conference. So we're at the point in session right now um, where uh, bills have, you know, passed the House, crossed to the Senate, passed the Senate, they cross back to the House, and then they go to conference to, you know, work, be, be negotiated. Or sometimes it's just because the budget, the budget always comes last. So bills that have large amounts of funding in them have to be um, go to conference to wait and see what all the moving parts of the budget are. But that bill would give $600 million to DHHL to help develop DHHL lands for beneficiaries. And I mean, that's just like a broken promise, really, you know? I mean, people have been on the waiting list for years and years and decades or, you know, passed away on the waiting list waiting for homes on DHHL land that they're entitled to. So that hasn't been adequately funded for them to be able to build. So that is that bill. So shifting gears just a little bit, um, you have your background as a teacher, and so I'm interested in how you think we can provide avenues for things like science, technology, engineering, and medicine-based careers to our island youth, and how do we also retain them into the workforce when they become of age? Um, all right, there's a number of parts of that question. Um, I mean, I think there there is that kind of curriculum getting added into public schools. I think we have some bills this year specifically looking at um, um, requiring that. It's it's kind of a decision. It's a little bit of micromanaging of the legislature actually to 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 do that because typically those decisions are left to the board of education. Um, but I think with the education, like a lot of it, it comes down to um, funding and teacher retention and and paying teachers adequately, right? To have like enough teachers here that are trained and ready and able to do, to do the work and do the teaching. And so there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot that we can do or have tried to do in that regard. Um, I mean, I would support raising pay for teachers and better funding education. And then, um, you know, you can also pick if you have certain areas that you feel are understaffed, we can, we've 
done in the past where we've said these are either hard to staff schools or hard to staff subject matter like special ed teachers or um, Hawaiian immersion teachers and you pay a higher rate to try to help recruit more teachers to that area. And then we've also um, looked at, at things where we would pay for the education, like pay for uh, you know, your education degree if you agree to stay and work in the state for a certain amount of time. So I think those are things that could improve education. Um, I think there's like the second part of your question, how do you retain people? I mean, <clears throat> I think it's it comes down to like economic diversification and, and you know not putting all our eggs in the tourism basket all the time, we have to have jobs available for people to be able to stay here and work in them. Um, if those jobs aren't there, then they'll go somewhere else to find them. And, um, and also like workforce development, probably even outside of the education system or built into the education system, I think we need to think about what are the jobs that are gonna be needed? Like as we build say more renewable energy projects or um, you know a little bit higher tech ag operations, for example, are the kids that were graduating out of uh, high school and college in Hawaii, are they qualified to be hired for those jobs? You know, if not, then there's gonna be people from the mainland coming in and taking those jobs, but then we would have failed in doing our job to adequately supply a workforce for the future that we wanna see. So I think focusing on workforce development is important. Uh, we'll head into uh, Native Hawaiian rights next. Uh, so Native Hawaiians need access to land set aside for their use, um, commercial, subsistence, recreational, cultural, residu residential use um, in general. So how you kind of spoke about um, the, the bill going in with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands for funding. How can you help expedite this in any way um, to make it a little bit easier to um, like, are there options in the house to make it easier to get um, uh, maybe a lease if you're a business owner onto Department of Hawaiian Homelands? Or because um, what I've noticed is like a lot of the commercial leases are from out of state um, uh, businesses. So how do we get like actual Hawaiian businesses on Hawaiian land? So you mean like for seeded land? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not an expert in this subject matter, so I'll do my best to answer. Um, yeah, I kind of changed the question because you, you kind of answered a little bit, so I, I did switch it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I think some of the constraints are that we have kind of processes in place to ensure fairness, so stuff is like put out to bid. Um, and I don't know, even when it's like, because the ceded lands are lands that are managed by, you know, the land division at DLNR, right? And then the, you know, 20% of the revenue goes to OHA, uh, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, because it's ceded land, or it should. Um, and, uh, but, you know, outside of that, I think they do have processes. And so I don't know if you could favor people from from here or not from here or of a certain ethnicity or if that would be legally problematic. I think it might be, I'm not sure. And you know, you have OHA on the other side of it too, where OHA wants, um, also wants the revenue to be maximized because it's revenue to them. So there's kind of like a <clears throat> competing interests that work there sometimes too. I don't know if that answers your question. I'm, I'm like I said, I'm not an expert on some of these land laws and the leasing stuff it gets really complicated. So I'd have to look into it further. I think you did a good job of it, at least explaining that it is complex and that there are multiple sites. So thanks for trying, <laughs> you did a good job. Okay. Um... Going into some social issues, uh, what solutions would you propose or have you proposed to continue to combat the drug addiction crisis, particularly particularly the methamphetamine and opioid epidemics? Yeah, I mean, again, this isn't, it's like, this is where I, an area that I know is a big concern and that a lot of work has been done and that I've co-sponsored a lot of bills, but haven't um, 
like been necessarily in the weeds of some of the policy on it. Um, I mean, I think that at, at a general level, I've always advocated for like making sure we're funding mental health care. Um, I've advocated for um, the, pro the projects in or the um, organizations in our community that have applied for grants and aid, um, like Bridge House and certain other, I can't, can't remember all the names, but uh, some of the um, drug treatment centers have applied and received grants from the state for their services, and that's directly benefiting the community. Um, and then, um, yeah, I mean, we need better, we need better mental health care and substance abuse services. We need a better health care system. And this all kind of ties in, it's like uh, substance abuse and homelessness and cost of living. And I think everyone recognizes it's a huge problem, right? Not just in Kona, but across the state. And sometimes it's frustrating because it's like these things are exacerbated by income inequality, by um, like not having a great healthcare system. And it's like some of the things we can't, like would be better need to be fixed nationally and would appropriately be fixed nationally. And it's challenging for us to fix them all in, in, in state. But there is a lot, not, not, don't take that to say I'm saying there's nothing that we can do or that we have done. I think we've, we've done or tried to do a lot, um, but it's tough, yeah. And I don't know about, I mean, sometimes also it's like we're an island. So how hard can it be to stop drugs from coming here in the first place? But this is a question for the, for the police. So I don't know, they've asked it before and it's like, well, I guess a lot is like shipped in or just like all the Amazon packages and it's like, difficult, I guess, but yeah, it's such a huge problem. All right, so we'll head into uh, land use and development. The state lease on military bases will expire in 2029. Um, how do you propose our local government should proceed at this time? Okay, another area I'm not an expert in. Um, I think the state should make sure if we are leasing the lands that we're getting adequately compensated for it, right? I don't think that we've asked for a whole lot in return in the past. And like, as we've seen with Red Hill, obviously there's um, very serious repercussions about how this land gets used. Um, and I think there's a lot of interest in having more oversight and say on that. And I think that can be tied into the lease process and the lease negoci negotiations. Okay. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to um, waste and the environment um, in this next question. So as you know, plastic marine debris pollutes our shorelines, emits greenhouse gases, harms coral, with, as long, with other marine species and seabirds. Um, so what legislation to reduce plastic, plastic use and transition to a circular economy for packaging did you support last legislative session? Um, I, and can you give us an update on those bills? Yes, okay, here's one I can talk a little bit longer about for you guys. Um, we, we did a lot of bills this year, actually. Um, I'll start with maybe some of the ones that died that we'll bring back in future years. So, um, like, of course, with, um, I'm sure I sh as I'm sure you guys all know, um, we want to, like, okay, sorry, let me back up. One of the biggest things that we hear about, by the way, from community members in Kona is just people complaining about the lack of recycling services. Like, they're so upset that the county reduced them and, like, super frustrated, and they've, like, spent their lives getting used to throwing things in the recycling and not the trash and now they don't have the option it's like super frustrating but i'm always like tempted to say to people too but i think it's it's hard to like explain in a sound bite it takes a longer explanation but you know recycling is also not a great solution like we need to to do more reuse and um primarily reduction to, as much as possible um so as far so you know, Hawaii is like the ones, one of the few, one of the first states I think that actually had a statewide plastic bag ban, although it was done county by county. And then a lot of the counties have moved to reduce some of the waste in the food service industry um, and with polystyrene or at least have tried to. Um, but there's still a lot more that we need to do. So some of the bills that we, we did this year and some of them sound really manini, but like 
I think they all they all add up. <laughs> so one of them was to um, end the use of like the small plastic toiletries in hotel rooms so that they could be replaced with bulk dispensers or um, uh, things that were packaged in sustainable packaging. Uh, we had a bill that would um, uh, adopt what City and County of Honolulu did with saying that um, like for to-go food, the, the forks and knives and straws would be only upon request to make that statewide so that they wouldn't automatically like throw the forks and spoons in your to-go food. You would have to affirmatively say, yes, I want it. Um, we um, had a bill that would have required minimum percentages kind of increasing over time of post-consumer recycled content for plastic beverage containers and in, imported into the state. Uh, I think that actually started out going beyond just the um, beverage containers, but I think based on pushback we got and just starting with smaller steps, uh, narrowed it down to like the containers that were already um, defined under the deposit beverage container program. Um, we had uh, have an electronic waste bill, which is not plastic waste, but also important that's still alive. So that's still moving. Um, and that would update a long needed update to the state's electronic waste program, require the producers to pay higher fees and up the percentages they're mandated to collect. And then a lot of that funding would go to the counties to help them increase their collection services. Um, and I know whenever I go through this list, I always forget something. The big one, of course, is like the EPR bill or extended producer responsibility, and that's going to conference and still moving. Um, so that's exciting, but it's not over till it's over. So we have to still wait and see what happens, but I'm pushing really hard to try to get that into a form that we can get some agreement on and, and get it moving forward. Um, I know we had a couple more because there were like eight bills, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I think we just, to me, I, I'm definitely passionate about it because I feel like even though we always get like kind of knee jerk reaction against, you know, from like say the food industry about anything that reduces plastic. And there are some uses of plastic that are difficult to replace, but there's like so many more that are, that are so unnecessary and wasteful and easy to replace. So as long as there is like low hanging fruit, we should be working on that, you know? Oh, the other one that's still alive is the, um, the, PFAS bill, so the, the forever chemicals. So this bill would, would um, phase out the use of certain types of food packaging that have PFAS. And that was based on a Washington state study where they actually did a study to identify which types of packaging actually had already available on the market, like viable alternatives. Um, and so, and then focused in on those ones. So that, that bill does that and that's still moving. And then it also bans out the PFAS in, um, firefighting foam. So this is not like explicitly a plastic waste bill, but kind of related to the toxic chemicals that you can find in plastics. Yeah. And just along the lines with the PFAS, it's related to the compostable service wear too, right? That mm -hmm. um, is being brought in as the plastic alternative, which is not a good alternative um, as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Congrats on those bills. I, I don't want to celebrate too early, but I know knock on wood, <laughs> like still, still a ways to go. All right. So we have a, a less glamorous topic. Um, half of the state's cesspools, 49,300 are on Hawaii Island. Um, so the county has been in violation of the safe Drinking Water Act and EPA federal rules and regulations since 2019, when the county took over responsibility of the large capacity cesspools at Pahala um, and Na'ala. Um, what do you suggest at the state level to um, do to improve our aging infrastructure in an equitable way? Um, well, there's like several different issues here. So there's the large capacity cesspool issue in Pahala, which is um, not something I've really been working on. I mean, and it, it's, um, I don't know what the county plan is. I mean, they're under like consent decree with the EPA. So it's like, they've got to figure it out. But then the county is also like, got this falling apart wastewater treatment plant in on the Hilo side. So it's like, just 
they're just like struggling to prioritize. We actually put funding, state funding, uh, I forget the amount, but quite a large amount in the budget for the wastewater treatment plant um, in Hilo. And that's pretty unusual because it is a county responsibility. And it's not like the state doesn't have, you know, a ton of repair and maintenance at every school in the state that's needed. I mean, people seem to often think, oh, the state has all this money. Why aren't they giving more to the counties? But the state always has lots of hands out for lots of needs that are directly the state's authority. And so coming up with this extra funding to give the county, even when that's really a county responsibility to pay for it is pretty extraordinary. And it kind of shows you the extent of the problem. Um, <clears throat> the stuff that I've worked on and that probably relates more to equity, um, well, the Paula situation is an equity issue too, but um, is um, the individual wastewater systems. And so that's like people whose home has a cesspool. Um, and I mean, obviously it's a huge environmental issue that we can't just keep letting all of these cesspools, especially not ones close to shoreline or drinking, you know, or water sources stay there, they have to be converted. Um, and we passed a bill in 2017 that set that deadline for 2050, which is still a ways out. And then I think we passed a bill the subsequent year that established a working group to figure out how to get there. So it's like the cesspool conversion working group. And I sit um, as a member of that. Uh, so the, you know, the cesspool conversion working group final product will be coming out like prior to next legislative session. And I think then for a lot of the bills we've introduced might get more traction because people who push back against them are saying, wait till the report comes out. Like that's kind of been an excuse. Um, but we still have had um, bills moving this session. There's one still alive that would provide grants to low and moderate income families for cesspool conversion. We used to have a tax credit that sunsetted. I think we should probably try to reinstate it. Um, a grant program is probably better for lower income families because one, they may not have tax liability and two, um, you would get the money upfront instead of having to pay for it and then get it afterwards. So I think we need a combination of, of both. Like a, we need a grant for low moderate income and a tax credit as long as you can't claim both, I guess, like people who are higher income could still claim a tax credit and maybe that would provide some incentive. And then, um, and then I think we need to start narrowing down like what are the sensitive, really sensitive areas where the cesspools are really problematic and are polluting the ocean now and, um, and try to get those to be converted earlier than 2050, but also providing the financial assistance to be able to do it. And I would just say too that the state, I think, is really committed to working on this problem, but we shouldn't let the counties off the hook to try to do their part as well, because it's fundamentally a problem created by the counties. And why does Hawaii County have the largest number, you know, per capita, more than half of all the cesspools in the state? Um, because they were still permitting new cesspools, uh, you know, up to the last minute when every other county, even in Hawaii, had stopped doing it, you know, decades before. And every state on the mainland had outlawed new cesspools like half a century before. So it was really backwards that we were doing it. Okay. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, back talking about schools, uh, what measures would you propose to increase the quality of our public schools? Um, and what aspects of our education system do you believe need the most attention? Um, I think what needs the most attention is teacher teacher retention, recruitment and retention, just having enough teachers. Um, and I think I talked about that kind of a bit earlier, but yeah, I think adequately funding our school system um, and supporting them, I, I think also in figuring out the work that they need to do. I think, you know, we do have a system in place where the board of education and, you know, and different individual schools even have some autonomy to decide some of these things. So I don't know that the legislature needs to come in and say, here's your specific curriculum for this, this class and that class. But I think adequately funding schools, um, which also relates back, I mean, and teachers and also relates back to housing. I think a lot of teachers, even that I've heard from directly in Kona have struggled with trying to, you know, find housing. They're you know, sharing homes with a bunch of people and then they're asked to move. And I mean, I'm sure you guys are all aware of how hard it is right now 
if you're asked to leave by your landlord and you have to go find a rental, it's if you can find anything, it's outrageously priced. So that's, I mean, how do you do that on a teacher's salary? So there's initiatives this year that also are looking at teacher housing and doing, um, actually doing housing development on some DOE land. Um, but then I think all the affordable housing stuff that we talked about earlier also relates to this. And then uh, increasing teacher pay, making sure that um, um, there's, there's a variety of like more kind of spe specific issues. So I don't know how detailed like with teacher pay, like um, teachers back, back when teacher pay was like frozen a while back because of the economic crisis in like 20, 2008, 2009, um, that never was recovered from. So there's a lot of teachers who've been working for years and years and years that never, that are barely making more than people who came on later because they never were able to kind of recoup the pay cut they took back then. And there was also like the furlough, furlough Fridays. Um, and then I think recruiting new teachers, all the things I already talked about basically, like it, creating incentives for new teachers to get trained. Um, and yeah, sorry, it's been a long day. Just no, it's great. <laughs> my, but my backup question with that was, um, do you support educational workforce housing, but it sounds like you do. Yes. Yeah. And I think our schools also need to do, um, I mean, this isn't something we have bills for, and it's just kind of something I like to talk about, but like, I feel like there's kind of inflation in our school system. And maybe that's kind of changing with the early college kind of stuff. I think that's been really helpful for a lot of people, but, but, you know, used to, you know, back in our parents' time or my parents' time, people could graduate from high school and get a good job. Um, and you got a good education from high school. And if you went on to college, that was great. And you were even more qualified. And now it's sort of like, well, if you really want any kind of professional career, you need to have a master's degree. Um, you know, if not, if not more, and now we're talking about um, you know, six to eight additional years of school that cost money and you're also not earning money at the same time. So there's this opportunity cost. And it's like, why can't we train people to be ready for jobs in their four years of college or their, you know, years of high school? Or it just, just seems like um, we need to figure out how to, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. I mean, I think a broad, well-rounded education is important, but it's not serving people to have them have to stay in school for so long just to sort of be able to, to get to that end goal. So I think the early college programs are really good because you can basically finish an AA degree like by the time you're done with high school and then it's just two years of, of college. But um, yeah, I mean, more kids could be doing that, I think. Or like, why not just make it so that a high school degree meant something more? <laughs> Than it does now. And then I think the vocational training kind of stuff is also really important. And providing that earlier might help, you know, providing more of that as an option or pathway that you could take in high school might kind of save some of those years, those years of extra training where you're not able to earn money. All right. Um, so we'll go into food security and agriculture. Uh, how would you support local food hubs or what other ideas do you have to support local fresh and easy access to healthy food, especially in rural areas? Um, I think we've, we've done a lot in recent years in this, like um, just with trying to build the local market. Like if we support um, farm to school programs and support um, farm to institution and other kinds of programs, you're really like growing, like increasing the market for locally grown food. And that helps to kind of be a sustaining, uh, sustaining source for farmers to know that they have someone to sell to if they really invest in stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a bill for a food hub this year, but I know that's something like Oahu has, I forget the name of it, but it's like basically has it done. Um, it's like a company that does it, but I think it's a great idea because a food hub will help like, um, you know, small farmers kind of aggregate so that uh, there's, yeah. So that's sort of easier for consumers to access what's available. Um, I think, 
there's just been a lot, there's been a lot of subsidies over the years, both, you know, federally and at the state level for certain kinds of farming and not other kinds of farming. And I think that we need to increase the support for, you know, small farmers that want to do diversified agriculture, that want to grow food for local consumption and that want to, um, you know, do organic or things like that. So I think that, you know, we should at the very least like level the playing field because right now it's not level at all. And it's all the kind of um, regulations, food safety requirements all favor large um, uh, operations that do a certain kind of farming, right? And so that's all stuff that, that we need to keep working on. Do you know, is there anything uh, related to cottage laws um, in the legislature this year or have? Have there been? Um, I don't think so. I know we have like a raw milk bill, which is sort of like that, or, or at least adjacent to cottage food. But I think it died. I think we might have passed it out of the house, but it died in the Senate. I haven't seen, heard of it lately, but I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't seen. Uh, I'm not sure that we have a bill. I'm not sure what our current laws are it sounds like maybe you know but um i'd be interested in in someone if some if there's someone who has experience with that because you're like directly a farmer trying to do cottage foods and running up against a wall it would be interesting to see what we could do to help i'll send some people your way <laughs> thank you nicole i believe that's about time and thanks for staying a couple minutes late uh, we really appreciate it learning from you and getting some updates on what you've, you've been up to in the legislature. So thank you, Representative Lowen. Um, thank you. And then one last little um, pitch here for Huli. So bring it back, um, Huli Pack, we're building something that we believe the political establishment in Hawaii has never seen before, a slate of Bono candidates. And um, we are accepting donations to help support these candidates in their upcoming races. So. Um, any contribution really counts, and we would encourage you to check out our website at hulihawaii.com, sorry, hulihai.com um, to learn more about our platform issues and how you can donate. So thank you everyone for, for tuning in and have a good evening. <laughs>